Good morning, everyone. My name is Matt Steinerfel. I uh, run a consultancy called Entree Consultancy. And today we're doing a webinar for our client Singer. Singer is a karaoke platform uh, which launched in Finland uh, a number of years ago and is now in 800 venues th throughout Europe and the United States and has been in the UK for just over two years now. Uh, I'd like to welcome our uh, speakers today. We've got uh, Karen Bosher, who's Managing Director for Premium Urban and Venture Pubs at Green King. Karen joined Green King in 2012 from JJB Sports, where she was Retail Director on the executive team. Prior to this, Karen enjoyed a long career in the retail sector, latterly at Mothercare PLC, where she was Head of Operations for eight years. Welcome, Karen. Good afternoon. Afternoon. Uh, next, we've got Jacqueline Bateman. Uh, Jacqueline is marketing director and co-owner of uh, Bateman's Brewery, based in Lincolnshire. Um, Jacqueline, Jacqueline's been involved with the family business for most of her life um, as a fourth generation Bateman. She is passionate about the business and Jacqueline originally trained as a nurse um, and spent a year in Hong Kong before coming back. Um, Big part of Jacqueline's role is to um, deal day to day with the uh, 51 tenants in their estate. And Jacqueline's very passionate about uh, this industry. Welcome, Jacqueline. Morning. You're what, morning? No, afternoon. Honestly, I am in the UK. <laughs> well, you're just down the road, aren't you, in Fulham? It's not far. <laughs> yeah, well, that's what I'm pretending anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, finally, we've got uh, Andrew Buchanan, who is Director of Pub Operations at uh, Daniel Thwaites Brewery. Andrew joined Thwaites in 2008 as a director of pub operations, having previously been managing director of the Tasca restaurants and a long career at Scottish and Newcastle and uh, the Spirit Group before that. Andrew is in charge of uh, just over 250 of their, their pubs uh, in the Thwaites estate. Andrew, welcome. Hi, hey, everybody. Excellent. Well, uh, just to start, how how things been for everyone over the last uh, couple of months? Uh, Karen, do you want to start? Um, well, uh, unprecedented, I think I'd probably say. Uh, it's been a very interesting time, one I would prefer to have avoided. But uh, given the circumstances, you know, the team have pulled together. Uh, we're now uh, largely open. We've got 1,200 sites uh, back open, 300 remain closed, more going live uh, next Monday and uh, you know we've worked really hard on the reopening uh, we were working on it through the whole of furlough we kept quite a few people out of furlough to get the reopening plans done it's been a massive operation to re-gear the business back up and you know we are opening to um, a business that I think we're pretty satisfied we've kept the pubs intact and feeling like the pubs that people uh, saw before Covid um, but, you know, it is transforming, transformed business. And I think we're learning on a daily basis sort of what the new rules are around how to operate it, how guests are coming in, what their hesitancies and concerns are about and how to create, you know, entertaining, nice social spaces that they can enjoy going forward. So, yeah, it's been been a big, big job, a big challenge. Thanks, Karen. And Jacqueline, obviously you um, run a tenant of the state within the Bateman's group. So uh, I don't actually, I'm actually marketing director for the whole of the company. So but you, you but talk, the tenancies you, are a big part. You talk day to day for with, with the with the tenants, obviously, and help them promote. The, yeah. the business. And what sort of feedback have you got, uh, at least during during the lockdown um, from from the different tenants? Well, we've had actually because we've been sending them emails about three times a week on a what's happening at the brewery, but also what the government was saying. Yeah. And also, we have also rung them once a week, and that's not just our own free um, tide trade, but it's also our free trade as well. So we've kept in very, very close communication with everybody. Mm. I think on the whole, everybody's, well, we're relieved but scared to be back. We had one pub opening, reopened yesterday, and they were scared stupid, but it actually went really well. Um, it has, I mean, our problem has been getting cast beer back into trade, because A, we had to brew it. Um, we're delighted that this week our second cast beer is now back in on, on the bars. So some things are going back to some kind of normality. 
what we have had a problem with is people living near pubs have been used to it, pubs being so quiet, obviously, for the last few months, mm. and now are complaining that suddenly there's noise in the pubs, which <laughs> I know, which has been a bit, hang on here, you live next to a pub, just because it's been quiet for a few weeks, it doesn't mean it's going to stay that way. Yeah. Interesting. <laughs> yeah. But it's, uh, it's really nice to be back. No, great. Andrew, you obviously want a, a mixed uh, tenanted lease and managed estate. So how, how have you, how have you uh, adapted that communication for your, your managed GMs and, and, and the tenants alike? Yeah, the, uh, the managed business is run by uh, a colleague of mine, but uh, I'm pretty close to what they've been, uh, what they've been doing. The, uh, a bit like Jacqueline, um, spent a lot of time communicating with our um, uh, tenant pubs or tenant customers during lockdown uh, and uh, very much uh, similar. A lot of nervousness, um, clearly um, I mean, the, in the eons that the pub, the British pub has been going, we've never ever had seen every pub shut. Um, so uh, that was a very unwelcome first. Um, and actually reopening uh, every single pub was also uh, a very unwelcome first uh, because of the task in, uh, involved principally with our, uh, uh, with our tenants but working with them on um, preparing risk assessments, um, uh, getting our businesses uh, set up to trade in a COVID safe environment, um, making sure that they have everything in place uh, to assist their teams and in a managed environment just introducing uh, we um, uh, we didn't have a, an order and pay app um, uh, prior to reopening. Um, the, um, we had some uh, fairly big uh, sites and large hotels where uh, a lot of people coming back to work. Um, the, uh, a lot of retraining, um, the, a lot of coaching, um, the, a lot of mentoring. Um, a number of uh, our teams, um, uh, both in our managed and in our tenanted environments, um, being quite nervous about returning to work, um, the, and uh, uh, yeah, the, 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 I guess the uh, a lot of things that we uh, that we thought of in advance, and a few things that uh, that came as a bit of a surprise. Um, but again, to echo uh, Karen's point, uh, every day is a uh, every day what we think is the new normal uh, changes a little bit. Um, so uh, it's. Uh, it's certainly uh, not something I would like to do again. Yeah, okay. and let's hope yeah. that if there are any uh, lockdowns, it's it's localized to a certain area, not not a national lockdown. Mm. Um, that brings me neatly onto the next question: How have, how have the teams um, adapted to all these new new guidelines and changes over the last uh, what's almost four weeks now? Karen, do you want to start? I can start. Um, so yeah, we did a lot of work, you know, exactly what Andrew's saying, really, uh, you know, I think any pub company that's reopened has had to invest in people, you know, it's been an easy process. We, we put together a scheme called Pub Safe, um, which has to go across a really broad church of businesses. I mean, we've got everything from, you know, pretty toppy wet lead boozers right the way through to gastro pubs and everything in between so finding some way of explaining the guest journey to the team because it was as much about the team as it was about anybody else so that they felt safe to return was a bit of a challenge but we tried to keep it as simple as possible so we've got five promises that we're effectively making to the guest and then you know we did invest quite heavily in ppe you know when you're mobilizing 38,000 people back into an organization. We had to place our orders really early um, and, and sort of put our, you know, put, put ourselves out there that we would require PPE whether we decided to deploy it or not, um, because we couldn't get hold, we were worried we wouldn't get hold of enough uh, by the time we came back to reopen. So we deployed uh, full uh, PPE into all the businesses and then we've subsequently given them advice about how we would like to see that used in the business. Uh, we're temperature checking on arrival with the team uh, on every shift and we're obviously using track and trace app technology um, for all employees um, that, that come in and work shifts. So I think generally they saw, you know, we, we spent a lot of time re-educating them. Uh, we threw an awful lot at them, particularly the GMs. We were really worried that they would be able to take so much on in sh such a short period of time. But I think because we'd really looked after them during furlough, you know, the appetite was really up. They really wanted to see the pubs 
back open. Their biggest fear was that they wouldn't see their pub reopen. So there was a massive sort of team effort to get things on its feet. And, you know, a lot of them came back to the businesses a couple of weeks early to get the businesses reopened. They had to work really hard uh, because we weren't bringing back tons of people off furlough at that point. It was too expensive for us to be able to do that. We couldn't justify it in our opening model. So it was just a, you know, it was very sort of humbling really to see how much they cared about getting those pubs back open in their communities and everybody sort of pulled together. I know we're a large organisation, but we do feel like a small family business when you work in it. Everybody knows each other really well. And, um, you know, exactly to Andrew's point, the day we shut those businesses down, I think everybody thought, you know, hell, you know, are we going to see some of these pubs never open again? So it was just a massive team effort to get them re-geared back up and, um, and, and they were amazing. So I think there's been a hesitancy and nervousness and apprehension, um, but generally we've been able to make them feel safe enough that once they're back, they kind of get into a new way of working. They, they've been brilliant. So yeah, all credit to them. I must admit, I had a really good experience at the Swan in, in Wimbledon the other week. Good. At your suggestion with, with Alex, the GM, absolutely brilliant. He, he, he basically took us through the whole process from um, the Track and Trace app uh, sign on to, to going through, through the venue, uh, letting us know about the different safety measures in place, and then uh, escorting us to the table and then showing us how to order. So it was a, a really great journey. Um, yeah. and a good insight. I mean, we've, we've put these host stations in you know and actually the managers really like them I think it's going to be hard to get them off them if we ever decide to remove them because they've quite liked having that control at the front of the business so and Alex loves all that so yeah he'll be, he'll be loving your hosting yeah that was a great experience and Andrew, what are you doing in your pubs currently sorry did you say me Andrew oh Andrew I didn't think so I'm quite happy if you answer uh, Jacqueline, but um, <laughs> the um, I guess it's a, it, it, it's that mixture. The, um, the in, a, in the tenanted environment, it's much more targeted support um, for our customer, our uh, our tenant, yeah. the, and uh, helping those guys uh, very much to Jack. Sorry, to Karen's point um, that um, uh, these pubs are clearly an integral part of local communities. Um, the, and where um, our, our customers have maintained that contact um, with their local community, they have fared so much better uh, coming out of lockdown. The, and it doesn't matter whether your pub is managed or tenanted, um, they are still absolutely rooted in that local community. And of course the teams um, that work in those businesses um, uh, are as much a part of the local community as they are an employee. Um, so uh, the, them being uh, very much part uh, of the whole reopening process uh, has, been, uh, has been absolutely key. In some of our larger properties, we've been able to do things in a slightly different way. Um, in our larger managed hotels, we have um, the welfare areas, uh, where staff report when they come to work uh, for those pre-check-in um, uh, temperature checks and uh, registration and uh, PPE, um, those various uh, uh, bits, bits and pieces. In our smaller businesses, uh, it's just an awful lot more localised. And people, of course, interpreting guidelines in um, slightly nuanced ways, um, the, um, which... Uh, uh, it just makes it work for their individual pubs. So, you know, a lot going on. Uh, what's been the biggest challenge that you've you've faced, Andrew, in, in getting all the guidelines implemented and communicating that to your tenants? Um, I think across the tenanted business, it would probably have been the uh, everyone's understanding of their own individual risk assessment. Um, the um, and making uh, or doing everything we possibly could to assist uh, in getting each pub COVID safe. Um, the, and I'm delighted to say that we haven't had uh, any reports of um, any negative comment uh, from the enforcement um, uh, folks um, who have been very active. Um, the, and that's great to see. Um, the, so probably just the uh, 
giving um, or making sure our uh, businesses are uh, are safe, uh, as well as giving the guest um, the confidence that the business is safe. Um, the uh, uh, and everyone just being happy that a it's a safe place to come and work, b it's a safe place to come uh, and spend some of your social time, uh, uh, and just be uh, as as normalised an experience um, as it can possibly be, uh, whilst uh, maintaining uh, the uh, the guidelines. Yeah, and Jacqueline, what's been your your biggest challenge when you speak to to your tenants? Uh, I know you mentioned some of them are quite sort of nervous to open, and, and not all the, the pubs have opened yet. You've got about three or four that are still mm. shut. Uh, what, what's your uh, what have you? I been think saying? it's been the nervousness of well, the nervousness of anything else about whether customers were going to come into their pubs. Yeah. Um, certainly the, the Butcher and Beast out just outside Lincoln, who reopened yesterday, which is a big food pub for us. Well, it's for them, it is. I mean, she was terrified that nobody would want to come in. And in fact, she's got everything in place. In fact, the pub looks amazing. Um, but it was just her and her confidence. She was, her, she was so nervous. And I think it was them taking that first step and suddenly realizing it's not as difficult. If they've got everything in place, they feel secure, the staff mm -hmm. feel secure, the customers are then gonna feel safe and secure. And I think that's why it's making sure that the staff are smiling and feeling secure. I think that follows on then to the customers. And the biggest issue I have is making sure that everybody uses either their Facebook or their website so that customers know what they're coming into before they come in. Otherwise, yeah, yeah. they're getting so many phone calls saying, what time are you open? What's your, suit? What's your safety? If it's not down, then they're wasting more time trying to answer the phone all the time. Good point, absolutely. And I mean, this is a question to all of you. Uh, how has your leadership style adapted to the new ways of working? <laughs> Who wants to start? <laughs> Nobody. Matt, you didn't brief us on that question. You're not allowed to. You also said there was no difficult questions. The, um, I don't know. I think it's. Uh, I think it's just be you know, as supportive uh, and as empathetic as you possibly can be uh, to the position that uh, certainly in our business that our uh, ten customers find themselves in, um, whilst trying to balance the needs of our own business. So the um, uh, just uh, I guess listening uh, you know, certainly during lockdown um, I um, uh, listened a great deal more uh, than I spoke I would think. Aaron. Yeah, well, I I kind of agree with that. I think listening, you know, this this you know this virtual thing, um, I think has been the biggest change because we're you know I think pub people generally are very activist we're out a lot we're quite sociable so then suddenly finding yourself trying to motivate the team through a screen i think has been challenging but i think we pulled it off okay actually we you know we've done loads of stuff we've got we've got um like a social space called kingdom where people gather and it, you know it'd be it'd be working but it was quite a dry forum but we've been doing uh, challenges from our homes and competitions we had um bingo nights and uh lots of, sort of sociability forums because we we were on a bit of a mission about well-being and uh, loneliness actually before lockdown which then came into really sharp focus and we became very conscious of quite a lot of our managers living on their own above pub premises they felt very despondent so we were trying to find ways that while they were in furlough that they could still feel part of the company and part of pub life and that you know they felt included we we had people sort of going around having socially appropriate coffees in the garden with them um you know things like that so i think just suddenly you know you're always aware with with pub retailing that you know it's it's beyond it's beyond a career you know it's part of a way of life and uh, you take on everybody, but I think you felt more sort of a, more of a duty of care and responsibility than ever before about their well-being, um, because some people really did struggle with the isolation. And I think they're so busy, suddenly being on their own that way was really tough for some of them. 
So I think um, I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm just normally so busy myself, then thinking about worrying about them um, was probably the biggest shift for me. Uh, that became the main thing, I think. But uh, yeah, we've all got, to, we've all become much closer. I think we've got to know each other in a really different way. Even the exec, we have a social on a Friday night at half past five where we all have a drink and started playing different games. And we would never have done that, you know. So I think we've just, the whole business has just been humanized at a new level, which has been great. You know, if, this, if there's anything great to come out of this awful thing, that would be it. I think at one point I was doing Zoom about seven hours a day. Yeah. That's why we had to meet in the pub, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> 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 what about you Andrew uh, yeah I think that whole socializing thing yeah similarly to uh, kingdom we've had our own workplace uh, piece in our uh, in our managed business um, the one of our exec colleagues retired halfway through um, the uh, uh, lockdown which uh, was the most uh, uh, bizarre retiral uh, drinks uh, Zoom call I think of uh, um, uh, I've ever had. So it, um, it is just such a different environment. We you know, very much to Karen's point that we in the pub business. So many of us um, they learn by doing, um, and we we are naturally you know people focused uh you know, doing stuff um they to suddenly be sat down and not doing um the and um not be uh meeting different people on a very very regular basis um and to be at home for so long the that was uh that was a real shock and of course for people who run pubs be, uh, be they tenants or managers, they spend their life talking to guests. Um, you know, the, from you know, comfortably, you know, it can be you know, twelve hours a day that the pub is open, and you know, they may not be on duty twelve hours a day, but you know, in some cases they're on duty for longer. Um, the uh, meaning, you know, meaning deliveries when they come in, meaning staff when they come in, through to uh, greeting guests when they come in. And all of a sudden, it's uh, it's them um, uh, on their own, um, and just so desperately keen to talk to somebody, um, and you you really understand the um, the, the the strength of feeling uh, that people have for their businesses and the passion that people have for their businesses when they're taken away from it. Good, very good point. And moving on to consumers, um, you know. We opened up on the 4th of July again, and uh, we had people coming back to pubs. Have they been sticking to the guidelines? How's the response been from, from patrons uh, to the new guidelines and all, and all these changes? Well, I think, I mean, the problem is that they are guidelines. Yeah. Um, and I mean, some people don't understand them. And I've, I've been into, of course, not a business pub, but I have been into some bars and you actually would not know that anything has happened. It just looks the same as it has always looked. Um, I think there should have been a bit more this, a bit more definite um, of what we should be doing and what we shouldn't be doing. And it should have been given us a bit earlier than a week and a half before um, the 4th of July. Um, but I think on the whole, the consumers, if they go in and see it's a safe environment, they are happy. If they won't, if they don't, if they go in and find it's not a safe environment, they won't be back. Yeah. But one thing that, can I just bring up one thing that I think has been amazing during lockdown, how, I mean, a lot of our pubs have been as busy almost because of takeaway yeah. um, and yeah. not just food, but alcohol as well. So, you know, a lot of our pubs haven't been sitting doing nothing. They've either been tidying up and getting themselves sorted for when they would eventually open up or um, already getting customers through the doors. And I think that is where there's been a lot of support from the new, the customer going back into the pub if the pub has been around helping them with takeaway, with it, whether it's booze or whether it's food, they want to then support the pub now. Yeah. And Karen, you, you quite early on with the Metropolitan Estate uh, trialled the Click and Collect app and, um, and delivery. That was quite a new thing for, for you to do. And that's, that's since rolled out, hasn't it, across more, yeah. more of the sites? 
Yeah, so um, we started on a bit of a journey to um, mobilise delivery, Deliveroo, Just Eats as a trial, but obviously this sort of accelerated that thinking quite dramatically. And Metropolitan have an independent, because they, they operate as an independent company really to the Green King businesses, and they have localised supply chains. It was easier for us to mobilise that team. So we opened 13 pubs two weeks after lockdown. Uh, exactly as the tenancy and independent would um, and we had a great response to it so it gave us a bit of confidence we managed to get a lot of learning for it um, a bit like uh, Andrew's team we didn't have an order and pay app embedded across the whole organization so that was a massive job to get that ready for reopening and actually it was the learning from Metro that gave us the confidence that a, it would be worthwhile and well received and that there was yeah. an appetite for that and uh, a bit like Jacqueline's describing you know we did manage to get some businesses into like for like growth because oh. there's been relaxation on licensing you know I think it, it is it is interesting about the you know the point that was brought up about neighbours because in the main people have behaved really really well coming into pubs because I think they're respectful they're trying to be good citizens they want to maintain uh, this social environment um, so generally we found people behave really well um, and that gentle relaxation from the licensing authorities to extend public spaces and outdoor spaces is pretty fundamental um, because I think one of the big challenges now is going towards winter again I think we're all concerned about when the pub comes indoors how do we weatherproof outdoor areas and certainly for those smaller businesses and I run a lot of businesses in central London where they have no outdoor space you know what are we going to do if we can't use the street space um, and yeah. I know a lot of our pub partners will be really worried about that because clearly those businesses in Green King tend to have smaller outdoor areas so um, yeah I think that's our next challenge you know we're already now starting to think about how the how on earth we're going to get through that. Well so. I think I think Westminster's done it very well because in Soho I was there a few weeks ago and they pedestrianized uh, Wardour Street, Dean Street, um, Greek Street, and Old Conton Street, yeah. and all the all the bars and 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 restaurants there had outdoor seating. Yeah, and uh, it was well organised. There was demarcated areas. Uh, you couldn't get a seat unless you were booked, yeah. uh, which we did, and um, it ran absolutely like clockwork. And then by about eleven thirty, the streets. Um, return back to how they were before with cars and taxis yeah. going past. And, they, and they've been brilliant because they've got a speedy license application process, yeah. which is generally taking 24 hours to turn around. When we get outside of that West End process, the new process will take up to 12 days, which, you know, 12 days for an independent business could be the difference between making money, not making money. I don't know why the rest of the licensing authorities can't go a bit faster and demonstrate that sort of vision that Soho have. I've got yeah. 17 businesses in that zone and we're out on the pavements and it's making all the difference for those businesses versus the city where we still can't go on the street. So, you know, the cities are massively compromised versus the neighborhood, suburban or country areas where we're getting really good traction on the plan. But, you know, London does remain a significant problem. So it's going to be a while, I think, before we feel a pulse there. And I've got 60 businesses open in the square mile at the moment. So that's tough. Do you think the they'll keep the licensing laws relaxed in, in Soho, as an example? Well, forward? I think, you know, they already had had a planning uh, sort of proposal in place, so I think, for a couple of years. So I think they've used this as an opportunity to accelerate their thinking. What I'm lobbying for at the moment is that the pubs get a fair deal here because it's very much focused on cafe and restaurant society so those extension of licenses almost um, sort of uh, they imply that you have to serve food to those tables which then disadvantages the, the you know the liquor wet lead businesses and on street drinking which is part of London life really and I don't you know I don't particularly want to see an erosion of that way of life I think you know Young's and Fuller's ourselves which are the th three biggest um, pub providers really for traditional pub drinking in central London um, would all say the same thing that we you know that that's a very big part of a reason to come to London is the pub economy and that way of life so I just sense that they're kind of leaving us out of the conversation a little bit and I'd like to see a little bit more intent for traditional pubs that serve great beer being supported in the same way as, as the cafe economies yeah 
and I'm sure that's likewise across all the cities in the UK. They'd love to have more outdoor seating, uh, particularly during the summer. You know, when they can but even the towns, I mean, not just cities, but towns as well. I mean, just generally, yeah. I think there should be more. Yeah. I think I uh, completely agree with Jacqueline. It's um, the, a lot of the focus um, for sure is on London. And the, um, uh, I, you know, the stories I hear of businesses in London really, really struggling. And uh, we, we have very few uh, city centre um, the locations, um, but certainly um, it's those city centre locations that are struggling most. But equally, um, the converse of that is um, we've got a pub on the, uh, in a village called Bevington in the world um, that it took our uh, fantastic uh, tenants there the, uh, a few weeks uh, to have the confidence to reopen. But they reopened with working with their local authority to give them access to a public open space immediately adjoining their car park. And they've managed to get 16 um, the outdoor tables uh, on there, um, the, and they have opened successful, with huge success, uh, and uh, giving that business real confidence uh, for the future. But also to Karen's point, the um, it's great in July and, uh, and in August, and hopefully we uh, will uh, will dream of an Indian summer um, into September. The, uh, but I'm not entirely sure uh, if I would like to sit outside um, the, on a bench uh, and the world uh, in the middle of November. Mm. The, so finding solutions um, the, uh, around that is, uh, uh, is, a, is a big challenge. But to go back, Matt, to go back to your point about the, um, the guest compliance, if you like, the, uh, uh, I, I think on the whole, um, it's been uh, absolutely fantastic. The, uh, but certainly what we are seeing um, the, and in conversations with others, I think it's fairly universal that the more you give the guest faith that your business is safe, uh, the more successful that you will be. The, um, uh, whether the guest is being compliant or not, the um, the uh, and but overwhelmingly, uh, I think customers are being um, uh, largely compliant. Of course, we see you know, the the media will pick up on uh, where it's not happening and take pictures of uh, you know, in that first weekend. We also uh, photographs from uh, Soho, um, the uh, of crowded streets. Uh, but then the next for the photograph that we don't see is of the next weekend where there's tables and chairs in all those spaces and, and yep. people are socially distant and are being yeah. compliant. And of course, our industry is so used to working in a, um, a very uh, uh, litigious framework um, that actually all we've done is add a few more rules in. Um, mm -hmm. the, and we can be compliant. We are always compliant. Um, the, so, and we are very, as an industry, we are very good at being compliant. So the, uh, I think the guest recognises that. That brings me neatly on to my next question. Is pre-booked and order at your table here to stay? Karen? I think it is here. I think it is here to stay. But I, I, I want to be really emphatic that we need to make sure the guests know they can still just walk in. You know, there's a host at the door. They'll show them through the journey. But 80 percent of our arrival in Green King currently is still the walk in. And I think people now have built a belief. The ones that we know that at the moment there are still 60 percent of our frequent pub goers yet to come to the pub. So 40 percent have come out. They like it. They're very confident and they're now regular returners. But 60 percent have still yet to return. And I think they think that they've got to they've got to pre-book to come. And that's not the case. I think still, pubs still have got a lot of capacity. And as long as they're prepared uh, to come along and sit wherever they they can. Uh, then we should still encourage the walk-in. So I'm just a bit worried that there's a notion building that you can't go to a pub unless you've pre-booked. And that, I think, would be 
a problem for the industry if, if that was a, a fun you know for the pub industry if they felt they always had to pre-book their occasion I would always encourage people to think I'll pop along see if I could get in clearly on those really sunny days if you want a, a garden space and you want to guarantee getting in then it's probably best to try and reserve yourself a space um, but it's not a prerequisite and I hope it stays that way and I think this is where I go back to I keep knocking on about digital marketing but this is where I think it's so important that people put on their, their social media and their websites what the situation is because I couldn't agree with more with Karen to actually pre have to pre-book and the only way you can get into that pub is by pre-booking a table I think they will lose customers yeah and I think there is actually a perception out there that at the moment you can only get a you can only yeah. go in if you pre-book uh, so maybe we need to change that narrative out there right now. Yeah. And so what, what efficiencies have you seen by implementing all these, these new technologies and apps and um, things like this? Andrew, what, what have you seen with, with, with tenants? Uh, I'm not too sure we've seen much in the way of efficiencies, to be honest, Matt. It's, uh, it's a more expensive way to operate. Yeah. Um, the... Um, yeah, immediately you install an app, then typically there's a could be increased transaction fee. Um, the with more table service, there's uh, uh, increased labour cost. Um, the I don't know how much the industry has spent on a hand sanitizer in the in the last six months, but uh, in the last uh, three four months, it's probably quite a big number. Um, the um, so efficiencies are difficult to get to. Um, the uh, but what we, I think what we are seeing is uh, a much more even spread, um, certainly in suburban um, locations, a much more even spread of the business through the week the, um, than perhaps we had pre-lockdown. Um, the, um, with people choosing to come out when they uh, perhaps uh, envisage that the businesses will be a little quieter um, and therefore a little safer. I don't know, that's just, uh, I've got nothing to back that up other than uh, um, just an anecdotal uh, comment. Um, the, um, but the, I guess that spreading that out makes life a little bit more efficient. Perhaps smaller menus makes things more efficient. Um, and perhaps uh, there's a number of operators realizing that they don't need um, the, uh, the 45 main courses on um, uh, on, a, on a menu and it, uh, it overly complicates life uh, and they can actually do quite well with 10. That, yeah. I mean that's that's what I saw at the Grinking pub when I was there Karen it was a very much scaled down menu but the, the offering was really good. Yeah I mean we, we're getting a bit of a demand to put sandwiches back in at lunchtime and some bar snacks in the evening so that people can still graze so I think we're going to learn as we go but you know certainly in those more comp we've only cut down menus where we've got compromised kitchens and we couldn't you know guarantee a certain level speed of service and safety in the kitchen we you know the swan is a good example where it's a really difficult compromised kitchen um so yeah i think we're, we're still learning about it i don't think there are many efficiency benefits but in terms of trying to drive better transactional value definitely order and pay app is showing that we can get some un uptick through People, people are saying, if I get to the pub and I sit at a table and I'm safe and I can keep pressing that button, I'm less likely to move. You know, I'm not, I'm not going to do a circuit so much as I used to. I'm happy here. I've got a seat. I'm, I'm probably going to stay. So it's early doors yet, but I think we know from the app technology and the read we can get there that people are spending more through the app. Is it compensating us for then having to do table service? Probably not. Um, but we are trying to convert people because we are still doing cash and, and uh, contactless transaction at tills. Um, but we are trying to convert as many guests onto the order and pay up as possible because certainly the behavior around purchasing improves at that point. So um, we'll be focusing on that to try and improve average spend values. Yeah. Andrew, I know you've got 21 hotels within the, uh, within the group. You know, we've, we've seen over the last week uh, 1.8 million holidays being cancelled, particularly to, to Spain. Have you seen an uptake in, in staycations and bookings across the, the hotels? Uh, yeah, uh, we have. Um, the, 
I chatted with some of my uh, colleagues this morning who run uh, that part of the business. They, and um, our, we have uh, uh, eight large corporate hotels, the, um, four star hotels with spas. Uh, reopening has been really difficult for them because the uh, corporate business has uh, pretty much dried up. Uh, conference and banqueting um, virtually non existent. They, um, and certainly up until last weekend, our uh, spa has not been able to uh, open. It was, um, there's not much of an incentive to go and stay in a spa hotel when you can't use the spa. Um, the, uh, but our um, uh, Popsworth rooms that are in the uh, Lake District and the uh, Peak District National Park, um, the business is, business is very strong. Um, we uh, have uh, our four pubs, with, uh, 11 pubs with rooms, four with in light flight growth last week. They, um, um, looking at uh, occupancy levels, the um, you know in the in those hotels in the in the nineties, um, so the uh, yeah there is a there is a big demand uh, for that and uh, corporate hotels. It, of course, it takes time to redirect um, the uh, that business model towards more uh, of a leisure market. Um, the but that will come. Um, the uh, that uh, that unquestionably will come. Um, the uh, but uh, in the honey pot locations, um, yeah, very difficult to uh, very difficult to book. That's well, good news. You're getting an uptick. Yeah, there's a small uptick, and it's, let's hope it continues. I think people have been quite wary about booking holidays um, over the last few weeks, and I think as we get into August, I'm I'm already looking myself down in Cornwall to to book a, a long weekend away. So. I can't be the only one um, thinking the same way. Nothing wrong with Skegness. Or, or Skegness. Could have come there. <laughs> or Beverly, if you want. <laughs> <laughs> or Solly Hell. <laughs> oh God, I'm starting something. Now you're, no, you're stretching it, Karen. I, I might be stretching it, do you think? <laughs> well, I mean, as, very nice. as we wrap up, um, yeah. <laughs> As we wrap up, what, what one piece of advice can you give to pub operators that, that haven't opened yet and are, are quite cautious or maybe doing that, that they're under circumstances where it's not viable to open yet? What, what can you give them as a piece of advice for, for when it does become safe again? I think if you're nervous about whether your customers will return, give them the chance. Yeah. They, you'll never find out uh, until you open it. The, where you are uh, com compromised through capacity, um, then uh, you know, do everything you can to look at uh, extending that capacity, be it outdoors. Um, I've seen some great examples of people um, the, uh, building marquees, um, the, to put in uh, on car parks and um, uh, just generally finding uh, another way. Our, our, our business uh, the people working our business are incredibly resourceful. Yeah. Uh, that's something that's come out loud and strong from this. Um, and they are willing to try and willing to learn. They, and the people who have uh, given it a go, for one of a better phrase, um, they uh, are, are, better, uh, are better off. Uh, but certainly uh, those who are nervous about reopening, uh, uh, they, I don't think we're... Uh, Currently in the position where, where that's where we have any of our pubs that are uh, closed through that hesitancy. Uh, but what we've been talking to people is, you know, you'll never know uh, how your customers will react, how your guests will react until you open the door and try. Yeah. I think also if you are nervous about uh, reopening, it's worth going and looking at other pubs and seeing that have yeah. opened. And, and learn from what they're doing now. I certainly, you know, because everybody can learn something at the moment. Yeah, talk to other DMs, I think, would be the way yeah. forward. You know, what but somebody's done quite, quite a lot of market research recently. I can well advise it. <laughs> Yeah, I think, I think that's a really important point. You know, I think a lot of people have gone ahead now. So there's there's loads of exa really great examples. You don't have to reinvent new rules now. I think some of that learning's already been done. Yeah. 
and, and keep it simple. You know, I was down in Wales last week, I am Welsh, and I, and I was talking to a, a, a publican down there and he had got himself into a complete knot about how he was going to open the pub and he'd made it massively complicated. And he said, oh. you know, can you just give me a bit of advice? I just went, well, do this and do this and do this and, the, and you're done. And he was like going, really? You know, he was kind of overthinking it a little bit. And um, I just keep it simple. You know, I, your guests want to come back to a, an environment that, that you've regulated and you're, you've done your risk assessment. But if they don't feel that, I think then you, you've won. Because <laughs> they'll, they'll, they'll be early adopters. Sorry, can I totally agree. I think the longer you stay closed, the more you rethink it and you think it and you panic. I went to one of our pubs the other day and actually added a hundred pounds to their tables because they put so many, they'd spaced it out so much. It yeah. was almost the other way that it was actually going to become a bit too unfriendly. And yeah. I said, you're, just re you're overthinking it. Just get on with it. And, and yeah. you, if your customers aren't liking it, they will tell you. Yeah. And I think people have got used to having a glass of wine in the garden, which is hugely pleasant. Yeah. But uh, the one thing a pub can give them is atmosphere. <laughs> and what, we, what we're, um, really trying to work quite hard on now is make because in the beginning people were quite nervous and that thing had gone out about don't put your music on um mm -hmm. so we were walking into pubs that felt like church halls and we we're going we can put the music on a little bit and that's just increased and increased and i mean obviously you don't want people having raised voices i think is the principle but you know well be tied you don't walk into a, into a silent pub you know put your music on create a nice feeling around it you can now have music in your gardens yeah. um and I think increasingly you'll be allowed to have music inside the, the businesses. And I think getting that atmosphere right might be a different one to the one you had before, but then people see that sociability and that atmosphere in that space. And that's what they're coming in for. That's different sitting with their mates in the garden. Yeah, okay. um, so, you know, work on your atmosphere. <laughs> and your yeah. smile. And you're smiling. <laughs> <laughs> we had a big debate here because uh, singers obviously they do background music and karaoke so we were debating what does it actually mean in the guidelines conversational level you know <laughs> <laughs> i'm not going down that road <laughs> <laughs> great thank you everyone for joining us today um we've reached the end of our, our time for the webinar i would like to thank uh, karen bosher from green king Andrew Patton from uh, daniel thwaitesbury and you're welcome and Jacqueline Bateman from Batemans Brewery. Thanks for joining Fantastic. us. Fantastic. Thank you, Matt. Thank you. Well done, Matt. Bye. Thanks, Matt. Bye for now.